Welcome to The Old Man of the Three with J.J. Reddick and Tommy Alter. Brought to you by 342 Productions. This is episode 155, J.R. Smith. Just a phenomenal conversation, a phenomenal human being. Um, we talk about this with J.R. I've competed against him for years, and this is the first time him, him and I have ever really sat down and had a conversation. And I'll be honest with you, he's an impressive human being. Yeah, he's an impressive human being and an all-time podcast guest. Great storyteller. Great, great storyteller, just naturally. Not a tryhard, he just, he just does it. He can tell a story about anything. We recorded this uh, a few weeks ago. There is pretty much 99% of this is non-topical. Um, so all of it is extremely relevant to JR's story. Speaking of JR's story, he has an Amazon docu-series out, four-episode docu-series called Redefined J.R. Smith. And we touch on some of that redefinition that he's had throughout his career. And of course, in his post-career uh, docuseries is very cool. Uh, I highly recommend giving it a watch. It gives you, I think, a different perspective on who JR is. Yeah, it just shows how motivated he is to, you know, to take, we, we get into it with him, but just to take these steps in his life when he, you know, could have been more complacent. Yeah. Decided not to be. Um so anyways, we'll get to Jared in a second. Uh, we are right in the middle of the play-in week. Uh, last night's games, the Lakers beat the Timberwolves in overtime, and the Atlanta Hawks, I think in somewhat of a surprise, absolutely uh, destroyed the Miami Heat in Miami, um, killed them on the offensive glass. 22 offensive rebounds. Clint Capella had 13 of those. Heat, of course, struggled to shoot threes like they have all season outside of Kyle Lowry, who had a big game. Um, it will be interesting to see um, what happens here with Miami because I don't think they are going to beat the Bucs even if they get the eighth seed. And it'll be interesting. I think it'll be an interesting offseason for yeah, the Miami Heat. I would say that was a, uh, it was a fitting game last night for how they've been all year. And we got, in, we got into it a bunch with them um, all season. It was disappointing, but I, I don't think it was particularly shocking based off what they've done this season. Yeah, and in the other side, the Lakers, of course, winning, and now they will face the Memphis Grizzlies. I'm particularly intrigued, I'll be honest, by this series against the Grizzlies. I think there's a lot of interesting basketball storylines. Uh, Dylan Brooks had a soundbite uh, yesterday talking about how he wanted the Lakers, and part of the reason, no, but part of the reason, and he, he acknowledged this, is you know, you're going against LeBron, and it's a test. It's a test, and he felt it's a like shocker. It, Dylan Brooks had a sound bite. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? I like the consistency of the brand here. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, I will also say these guys, these guys want to be in the big show. You know, they want they want to be in this moment. They've wanted to be in this moment since they've made this jump, and now they're here. It's like when you play LeBron and the Lakers, you're in it. Everyone's going to be paying attention. What were your initial thoughts? Um, crazy game last night. What were your initial thoughts watching it? Uh, and then especially the last, you know, minute of, of um, the fourth quarter and then going into OT. Not surprised the Timberwolves played well. Um, they shot the shit out of the ball uh, for much of the game and and then really faltered down the stretch. Didn't get really great looks. Um, I think they, they created three open looks in the fourth quarter and overtime from three-point range. Uh, Mike Conley was great, of course. Um, my, I said this on first take today, my eyebrow raise moment was not that Anthony Davis fouled Mike Conley on that three pointer that sent the game into overtime. My eyebrow raise moment was what preceded that foul. And the Wolves, needing a three, ran a simple flare screen for Mike Conley. And the two defenders involved for the Lakers were LeBron and AD, and they completely botched the switch. And I brought this up today. And I think it's important to note this moment because I go back to, first of all, Matt Ryan hit a three to beat the Pelicans earlier in the season when he was on the Lakers on a very similar play. There was a little bit of a fake misdirection wheel action to prior to the flare screen, but same spot on the floor, same action. So it's not like the Lakers haven't seen that before. Um, but I, I go back to last year's game one, uh, Memphis Grizzlies and the Golden State Warriors, you know, what turned out to be a very competitive series, Grizzlies up two with about 30 seconds to go, and they botch a switch. Clay Thompson gets an open three, and then John Morant misses the layup. 
Uh, so that's that's a pivotal moment in a game. I go back to 2020. Lakers this time on the other end of it. Anthony Davis hits a three-pointer uh, down one against the Nuggets at, at the buzzer in the Western Conference Finals. Mason Plumley had just gotten substituted into the game. Him and Will Barton botch a switch. Like, you can't have that happen at the yeah. end of a pivotal game play, like this. In a playoff game. Like, I'm if someone game. draws up an insanely detailed uh, play with misdirection and it, it just perfect timing, like the wheel action or the the victory play that Brad Stevens used that um, uh, Clay Thompson, the Warriors, had earlier this year when Clay hit a three where they throw it across court. Clay gets uh, a screen up top and then gets a rescreen going back towards the ball. Like, to me, if you get beat on that play, okay, all right. But this is what's important in the playoff times. I yeah. broke down last year the Toronto Raptors botching a switch, point switching like this, and Joel Embiid hits a game winner. So that, to me, was the eyebrow raise moment, not that he fouled him. Well, they had a few of these mental mistakes down the stretch. They had two different inbounds. Uh, they, they didn't really get burned on either of them. Obviously, you know, Prince missed the three at the end of OT. But these were just, these, those are just giveaways. I mean, there was, there was no, there's nothing else to it besides that. And it's kind of like, you, to your point, you can't really win in May if you're doing that. Maybe you get one a game or something like that, but you can't do it. And it's puzzling because one of those turnovers on the inbounds play was LeBron. Yeah, and so LeBron and AD, two guys you don't think would mess up a simple switch. Uh, LeBron turning the ball over and in inbounds. The other one was Austin Reeves. Like I, I don't know. I want to preview this series a little bit though. Lakers and Grizzlies. So Grizzlies are the favorites according to DraftKings Sportsbook. They're minus one twenty five. Lakers at plus one oh five. Um, there's a bunch of cool stuff that you can draft on this um, series length over under series correct so score exact number of games all this stuff. Um, when I look at this matchup, let's first of all start with the fact that Memphis has home court. They have been, I think they were 35-6 and six at home this season. Um, that's important to me, and, and that's not to say LeBron and the Lakers can't go win on the road, but Memphis is really good at home. Uh, one of the things to look for, for the Lakers specifically, is their turnovers. Um, because they had a, they had some turnovers last night. LeBron had some turnovers last night. They have to limit their turnovers. The Lakers have the fourth best defense post All Star break in the entire NBA. Memphis has been a top three defense all season long. Memphis needs transition points. They need fast break points. That's how they win. And if you're turning the ball over against the Grizzlies, you're going to be in trouble. Some of this going to come down to D'Angelo's health. Well, so. I think Daniel's got to play well and he's got to be healthy. Um, he finished the season so strong for them over his last 13, 19 a game, shot 42% from three. The he, I'll give you a couple matchups, right? I, of course, Dylan Brooks is going to guard LeBron. Like th there's a matchup for you, of course. The, the, the two matchups that I think are really intriguing to me are going to be Austin Reeves and Desmond Bain, two guys that both finished the season playing excellent basketball. Uh, Bain, I, I think, had a great season. I know he missed a ton of time with the toe injury. 22 a game since March 1st. 50% um, from the field, 40% from three. Reeves at 18 a game since March 1st. Over his last 20 games played, 42% from three. Uh, the production in the half court for those two players specifically, I think is going to be really, really important because both of these teams at times struggle to score in the half court. So those are two guys I'm looking for. And then the other one, of course, with Brandon Clark being out for the year, Steven Adams likely being out the rest of the season, even if Memphis makes a deep playoff run, is Jaron Jackson Jr. on Anthony Davis and how much they attack that matchup and try to get Jaron Jackson Jr. in foul trouble. So uh, Darvin Ham mentioned this after the game last night. Even though AD had a good game, you know, sort of counting stats wise, they get 24 and 15. Yep. He said they should have gotten him involved more. And that was on him. Basically. Is that something you think game one, basically just like almost like run everything offensively through him and see if you can try to kind of coax Jackson to a couple of dumb fouls early. We've seen this a lot with the Lakers since AD joined where LeBron makes it a point to get him the basketball early in the games, early in halves, early in quarters, uh, LeBron picks and chooses his spots depending on whether or not 80s on the floor, depending on whether it's closing time. 
Um, so I think it's going to be a huge emphasis this series to give the ball to Anthony Davis, who, by the way, I just want to say this because I know we talked earlier this week about my uh, uh, all league teams, my all NBA teams. Like he met my threshold for games. Uh, I I consider Anthony Davis a center, and so I, I didn't have him over Sabonis, but he had an All NBA season yeah. in the games that he played. He 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 was great this year. It's it's something where he he's been he's been sort of ridiculed a little bit over the last two seasons. The guy was awesome when he was on the basketball floor this year. Well, obviously, and then I mean, you, you talked about Jaron, the defensive player of the year. Both these guys, I mean, it's two all these two, two All NBA caliber centers. The other thing I was going to ask about. Um, but last night, you know, the Lakers did a good job on Ant. Uh, is there something about the way they defended him with Vanderbilt and AD in particular that is, do you think, is sort of transitive to a player like Ja, or are they just very different offenses? I think they're different players. Uh, I, I I didn't know this till after the game. I guess Anthony Edwards uh, is dealing with an elbow issue right yeah, now too. Either, so yeah. you know, I think probably some of the, on the shooting elbow. So I think some of that maybe is. Um, contributes to that that bad shooting performance last night. But look, Ja, ja is uh, is get in the paint, get in transition, go, 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 attack, 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 uh, elevate, side in the air type guy. Um, so I, I do think uh, specifically with Ja, um, I think it's probably likely that Vanderbilt starts on him. I, I, I could see that. Uh, probably goes under screens at times. There probably will be some switching. Um, on the other end of the floor, I'm curious to see how uh, the Grizzlies defend uh, LeBron and AD pick and rolls, whether they play Jaron Jackson Jr. in a drop or whether they switch and Brooks ends up on Anthony Davis. Um, Jaron Jackson Jr. is uh, just an absolute wrecking ball of a defensive player, by the way. I was reading Zach Lowe's stuff today on him, um, and it's just, I, again, I in some ways I felt validated. <laughs> By my decision to vote him defensive player, it feels year. like the one. I mean, obviously, there's a couple of Mobley fans, but it feels like the one decision that everybody is like, "Yeah, this is you know, this this is this guy's award to lose." Um, debate on one other thing, I just want to mention on DraftKings Sportsbook because I know both these teams are on my list of teams, or have been on my list of teams that I think can win the Western Conference, which is very different from my, the teams that I, we're not different, but it, it's a smaller number of teams from the West that I think can win an NBA championship because ultimately I think there's just a few teams that could potentially beat the goal, uh, the uh, Boston Celtics, the Milwaukee Bucks. And, and in my mind, I think it's the Phoenix Suns, uh, healthy Golden State Warriors teams and the Nuggets. Those are the three that I think could potentially beat the winner of the Eastern Conference, whether that's the Bucks, the Celtics, Sixers, um, one of those three teams is, is, is my favorites. But uh, for these two teams, the uh, Lakers have the fourth best odds in the Western Conference, and the Grizzlies have the fifth best odds to win the Western Conference. I wonder if somebody who works for the Grizzlies will have this on a, on a uh, somewhere in the locker room at some point. It feels like a team that thrives off motivation. And I don't think uh, I don't think any two seed wants to be an underdog in a uh, in a first round series, but especially a team like this. Yeah, I'm just curious if this is the kind of thing that they may see, uh, and maybe will be depending on how next week goes. Will we be repeating at some point? Look, man, they're professional athletes. You gotta do what you gotta we're do. always we're always looking for motivation. Yeah, we're always looking for motivation. It's NBA playoffs time this week. Everyone can score a no-sweat same-game parlay every day during the NBA playoffs. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app using code JJ, opt in, and place a same-game parlay on any NBA game. If it doesn't hit, you'll get a bonus bet back up to $10. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code JJ. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. In Massachusetts, call 800-327-5050 or visit gamblinghelplinema.org. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY-467-369. In Kansas, call 1-800-522-4700 on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, Kansas. 21 plus in most eligible states, but age varies by jurisdiction. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details and state-specific responsible gambling resources. See show notes for details. Uh, all right, let's get to our awesome conversation with 
J.R. Smith. And uh, J.R., I can't wait to golf with you this summer. All right, let's welcome in J.R. Smith. Can't tell you how excited I am about this. A couple things I want to get out of the way. Number one, it's a real shame to me that you and I have not played golf together. Uh, Tell me about it. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm pretty sure if I had to guess... The courses that I've been lucky enough to play, you've probably played a lot of them too. Probably. So I feel like we need to set something up this summer, make it happen. Let's do it. All right. Absolutely. Um, second thing I wanted to say before we get started, Tommy, JR and I were at the same position. Um, our careers spanned basically the same amount of time. Yeah. We had to guard each other a lot. And sometimes you busted my ass. It's a lot of times you bust my ass. <laughs> Sometimes I busted your ass. And I just want you to know, and I don't think we ever, re- maybe we talk shit a little bit, but I, I want you to know, I'm de- being dead serious when I say this, I loved competing against you. No, like I too. loved playing against you. I, appreciate I knew it, it was always going to be a, a, like a competitive, I had to lock in defensively. I knew I had to work to get my shot. Like I just, I really enjoy competing against you. I'm not going to lie, as a guy who's more of a, like a quote unquote scorer, I hated guarding you. <laughs> running around chasing you bro is like the worst especially when you got somebody like cp who's looking to find you oh my god i got a lot of i got a lot of flack on my film because of you so thanks so many years. <laughs> i'm sure there was t- you know what's funny though there were times i remember a specific game uh in la when you were on the Cavs, and it was the second half and like you hit three or four shots on me in a row and we watched them the next day in film. And I'm like, there's fucking nothing <laughs> else I could have done. The shot making at times for you is always impressive to me. I appreciate it. Unfortunately, I worked on a lot of bad shots in practice. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably why I didn't get along with a lot of my coaches. They didn't like me working on my shots, the shots that I shot. I was going to ask JJ, I was going to ask you about this because there's a, there's about seven YouTube montages of just your craziest threes. And like, you know, you guys are both top 23 point shooters of all time. Did you ever, as a shooter, look at some of these shots? We, we talked about this with Dame a couple of weeks ago and just be like, what the fuck? Like, how does that go in? Honestly, I look at my own shots and I feel like that <laughs> a lot. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult because, you know, when, when, and, and other than anything like other than in golf, like, you know, when you play in basketball and especially when you grow up doing it, you got that muscle memory and certain things you just naturally have a knack for and for whatever reason like I always felt like at the end of the shot clocks going back to when I was a kid in the backyard I felt like I could always make those shots for whatever reason during the course of a game it's like I could be wide open in the corner and I'll hit the side of the backboard hit the side of the rim but give me that ball within two seconds I feel like it's going in for sure there's it's a special skill and a special talent to be one of the guys and I played with one in Jamal Crawford yes who willingly would fall on grenades. Oh, yeah. Like, he would tell us, <laughs> no, 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 four seconds of the shot clock, give me the ball. I don't like, care if I'm at half court. <laughs> Get it over here. I was going to say that because you play with Jamal, and that, like, Jamal is, like, obviously one of the best ball handlers we've ever seen, but people don't give enough credit to his shot-making ability. Yes. Like, he makes a lot of tough shots. Yes. And, and and like you, he took a lot of tough yeah. shots. <laughs> so some nights, For sure. so, the variance, you know what I mean? Yeah. Night to night when you're taking tough shots, like you have some good shooting nights and you have some off shooting nights. It's, just, it's, it's part of the, it's part of the trade-off. Yeah. It's part of the trade-off. Um, JR, you just released Redefined. Yeah. By, uh, Redefined JR Smith, a new docuseries from Uninterrupted. Um, what was it like to sit down and tell your story. Um, I mean, it was nerve wracking, honestly. Like when I really, when I still think about it, I kind of make makes my palms sweat because back in the day, like when I was a kid, like my education was like always second fiddle. You know, when I was in second or third grade, I remember standing up in front of the class, teacher picks on me. You know, you got to read this sentence out the book that everybody's looking at, and you know, I had, I was, I'm dyslexic, have ADHD, so for me, that whole concept of sitting there reading out loud was ridiculous like and I was so intimidated and the words would get mixed up and like I just remember that feeling and like I never want to feel like this again and I shied away from my education so much and I just threw everything into basketball football baseball so I didn't have time to think about anything else it was just consistently sports so for now 
to start the doc, like they got me reading on uh, reading one of my papers and stuff. And this is like, took me all the way back to that same feeling, like feeling that anxiety almost. And uh, for, fortunately I've gotten better with it throughout the show, but it was so much, so much nerves. Cause for one, uh, something I'm already insecure of too. I don't, I'm, I'm making it so public. I don't know how everybody else is going to perceive it. I don't know, you know, how my peers are going to look at me now because I'm sitting here being so open about everything in my life that I've been insecure about. So it's like, it's tough, but fortunately I feel like, you know, through therapy and have great relationships and friendships that I'm, I'm getting through. The natural question I would have to that is, is the why, why did you decide to put yourself out there? Uh, well, for me, I got four girls and I think that's very important to, to show my, my girls how submissive I can be as a dad, as a, as a, as a black male dad, they need to see me being vulnerable. You know, it's not enough times where they see me in that, in that light. And for me, I think that's just a, one of the greatest curves you can give because, you know, obviously we're professional athletes. We have kids. Some, some people want their kids to to do what they did, whether it be basketball, golf, whatever. And for me, I never really cared about my kids trying to be the next me. I always wanted to be the, the best version of themselves. And for me, for, for her young women, I think for, in order for them to be accepted and being able to understand who they are is a part of that is watching their parents. So when she see, when Eric, my kids see their mom and they see me and they see how real we are and we're not going to sit there and, and sugarcoat shit. I'm not going to bullshit you and tell you something I, I don't know. I'm going to look it up, tell you I don't know and, 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 and go about it. So when I'm able to be a parent and be influential in that moment, like I'm sitting here writing papers and on my computer and my, my youngest is four. She walks up like, dad, you doing homework? I'm like, yeah, she gets her little worksheet she got from preschool. She comes right up next to me. I'm like, that's what it's about. Like I, I care way more about that than just trying to teach you how to shoot a jump shot. Yeah. In terms of the process of you deciding to go back to school, was that a similar, were you going back and forth on it? Or was that something that, you know, when you sort of decided uh, I'm done playing, like this is a thing that I wanted to pursue and you were pretty steadfast on that? I mean, like a lot of guys who came out of high school, um, I was, I had the same promise to my mom. Like, mom, I'm going to go get my education after I get done. I promise you I'm going to get my degree. It's not over. And I get like nine, 10, 11 years in. My mom was like, you're not going back. Like, don't worry about it. <laughs> like, the, you, I'm gonna let you keep that promise. Don't worry about it. And, uh, but fortunately, you know, a, another NBA brother, my Ray Allen, who who is a very serious person, very like, you know, regimented guy, who very, um, just an amazing person. He, we went on a golf trip and in DR, and I was watching him going back and forth to his computer and whatnot, and I'm like, Ray, what are you doing? He's like, oh no, I'm 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 working on my masters. I'm about to get my masters in a couple of months. I'm like, your yeah, masters? Like, first of all, your Jesus Shuttlesworth. Like, what do you <laughs> need a masters for? You can get you can walk in anywhere you want to, and people are going to take you serious. People are going to, like just. He's like, no, it's not about them taking me serious. It's about me taking me serious. You know, continuously elevating myself to be the best, well-rounded individual I can be. And I always thought about that from an athletic standpoint. I always thought about from a basketball player, oh, I want to get my handles better. I want to be able to shoot off the dribble better, going left, going right. And I would work at that so much in the summertime and stuff like that, but I wouldn't work on anything else. Like I wouldn't work on being a better friend or being a better son or being a better uh, dad or being a better boyfriend or, or husband at the time. Like I didn't work on anything else other than basketball because I felt I only looked at myself as a basketball player. So this title of this docu-series, Redefined, <clears throat> strikes me as fitting, especially when it comes to you. Because part of, I think, your story is people's perception of you. Yeah. And I want to I touch on that in a second. But the other part of it is what you just said. And I think every athlete has to go through that. Yeah. Redefining who you are. Because our identity... I know mine was, was so wrapped up in being a basketball player. And that's a yeah. really, really hard thing to let go. And I was particularly struck by this idea that you just so eloquently uh, articulated, which is we spend decades working on our game. Yeah. And because of that pursuit, and it is at times a singular selfish pursuit, I'll be honest. 100%. Because of that pursuit, 
we don't work on a lot of other stuff. Right. We can be well-rounded individuals, but the work on ourselves, the work on our relationships, dude, I'm going through it right now, you know, in terms of the work on myself. And I'm my first year of transition from retirement was like, great. And then all of a sudden that honeymoon period wore out oh, yeah. and I'm now like, oh shit. Like I actually have some things that I need to figure out Yeah, for you because I feel like we had different, different retirements, so to speak. You know what I mean? For, for you, what was the hardest part of leaving the game? What is the thing that you sort of miss the most? Uh, definitely the locker room. So like being around the guys and like, Obviously, you compete and stuff like that, but we have now. I have golf to compete to to yeah. to crave that itch. But like for me, like the day in and day out, going into locker room, seeing the guys, and then like that whole transition, like especially towards the end of my career, because I really started playing winning basketball. So I understand like my mentality changed. My first. 10 years, I was playing damn near meaningless basketball up until, I think, in 2009, we we took uh, the Lakers to the Western Conference Finals. And other than that, we get to the Knicks. We had the one good run. So from, like, the first better half of my career, it was just like, oh, okay, well, we're going to get blown out. So let me just do what I do to make sure I stand out, in, in a sense, you know? So for by the time I got to Cleveland, it was like, oh, no, you know, I'm not showing up at 10 and practice at 11. I'm here at 8 getting treatment, I'm lifting, I'm eating, I'm doing, like, I'm watching Braun. I'm like, oh, no, 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 this is what, this is how we win. So my mentality completely changed. So it was like, my accountability on, even some of the things like, not feeling like I had a fair shake, like, accountability, like, I added a lot of that to the situation to where it kind of weeded me out. So like, that's why I fear for like young players and talking about bringing, bringing the age group back down, it's it's hard because I was that high school kid who was that 18, 17, 18 years old, go to a really bad team, not really that good with vets, like don't really like young players. So I'm 17, 18 years old. I'm around 35, 36-year-old dudes looking at me like, what am I doing there anyway? Is that the best situation for me? Probably not. Now, if I'm going to San Antonio or one of those teams who are uh, have a winning culture and a winning, like that winning mentality, I can learn in how to be a, the right pro, you know? And a lot of that, I don't, you know, just put on the vets because a lot of it was me too. I was, I thought I knew everything. I was 17, 18 years old. I just came to a boatload of money. So it was, how much could you tell me, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 it's the same thing for me, by the way, the, the uh, camaraderie. Yeah. Uh, I, I miss the competition. And as much as I get that in golf, it's not the same. I'm not competing against Tiger or Justin oh, Thomas. No, no, no. Like, you, there's something about like right. the highest level of competition. We got to do it for so long, which was just incredible. But the locker room, man, the plane rides, Bure. I'm sure you oh, played Bure. Yeah, Bure. Um, I miss the I miss the dumb guys who play Bure. Guys, you can take it. <laughs> oh my of. god, it was so easy. <laughs> It's like, oh yeah, I'm in, I'm in. Give me five. Like, wait, what? You know how much is in there? Okay, cool. Give it to him. Yeah. Let's go. I was having this conversation this past week with some of the dads of uh, Knox's teammates, the, my son that I'm coaching, which I mentioned to you before. Mm -hmm. I told them, uh, guys, I know a lot of people have poker nights. <laughs> we need to have a Bure night. Right. I can teach y'all. Oh, and sure. they were like, <laughs> they're like, bring cards to next practice and teach us. <laughs> and then we can set up a real night. The greatest thing about Bure, by the way, I feel like any other card game, I'm going a little rant here, any other card game, to an extent, can be played in an enjoyable, oh. fair manner without money on the table. Agreed. Bure requires there to be money on the table. Yes. And that's what makes it so great. Yes. You've got skin in the game. Can I ask both of you guys a question game. about this? Because I've been... Uh, observer of some of these games i have not put my own money into them but smart so the amount of money that is on the table sometimes when these games are happening like the middle of the afternoon is shocking <laughs> and it's like how do you not get stressed out i play with ai so that game was <laughs> i've seen piles of money it's, it's hard not to get stressed out because it's like i don't really think like a lot of guys I talk to the younger players and this is like the hardest thing about younger players because like they'll get caught up in the moment They'll literally get caught up in like 
like gambling and camaraderie and not realizing like by the way, this guy is making forty million this year. <laughs> You're on a, a, a three hundred fifty thousand dollars salary, bro. But I just I just want you to know that if you play this hand, that that's, that's fifty thousand in here. Your ch- like your next couple of checks is gonna look light. Yeah, this is not gonna bother him. He's gonna go sleep like a baby. Do you when when that's happening? Are you more in competitor mode? Like I want that money, or there, more I, like teammate mode? Like I'm gonna tell you, don't. Like maybe take the next couple of plays off. Depending on who it is, honestly. I there were times that we had to we had to step in. Yeah. If that makes sense. And yeah. just be like, hey man, you're gonna sit the next couple trips out. Right. This is, you not, know what mean? No, this is no. not good for you. Okay. Especially come back you, in a couple years right. after you sign your deal. Like, I'm not sure you have this money to lose. Yeah, I love Vaughn to death, but we had a kid in Denver named Von Wafer. And when I tell you he used to get cleaned up at the table, cleaned up. And I'm sitting here like, you got Kmart right here who just signed a 90 some million dollar deal. Amelo's right here, Max guy. AI's right here, Ben Triple Max. Like you got Andre Miller here, like dudes who are really realistically banking. And I, I wasn't even playing that much at the time. So I'm sitting here watching and I'm looking like, bro, you just lost? He's like, yeah. I'm like, that, that was 20,000? He's like, yeah, I'm like, okay. And then I'll, I'll like take a nap or something and come back up and he's still playing. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, you got to know when to go. Tommy, to your question about the anxiety of a, of a large pot, I actually got more anxiety when I would get a great hand on a large pot because I could, I could feel the money. I could mm. feel it almost. Yeah. <laughs> it was almost in my possession. Was it hard not and to I, give it away? I, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I, I would just, man, I'm just like, oh, it's, it's, I'm so close. Please don't, nobody fuck this up. That's it. Nobody, nobody do something that doesn't require, you know, cause there's a lot of things, guys, guys would intentionally fuck up a hand 100%. or intentionally fuck up a deal, whatever. And they're like, I'll, I'll pay the penalty, but it ruined the pot. And, uh-huh. and all of a sudden, you're the guy. I'm sitting here with Ace King Queen, you know, suited, and I'm like, oh, I'm not going to win here. Right. That's that's what was frustrating. It's NBA playoffs time. That means big hoops action with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Get in on the excitement of every game with the touch of a button. New customers can make a $5 pregame money line bet and score $150 in bonus bets if their team wins. Plus, everyone can score a no-sweat same-game parlay every day during the NBA playoffs. Open the DraftKings Sportsbook app, opt-in, and place the same-game parlay on any NBA game. If it doesn't hit, you'll get a bonus bet back up to $10. I know we are very intrigued by the Memphis Grizzlies and Los Angeles Lakers series, and I will be watching game one. And I've got the Grizzlies winning game one. Download the app now and sign up with code JJ. New customers can make a $5 pregame money line bet and score $150 in bonus bets if their team wins. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code JJ. Um, you, you mentioned your rookie year. What was the hardest part? Uh, adjusting to the NBA, coming straight from high school. I believe you were the second to last class. Yes, because yeah. my class, my 06 draft was the first with no high school kids. You were 04. So what was the hardest thing? I think the hardest thing was, like, understanding I had so much time in the day. Like, I went from – I got coached by the Hurleys in Jersey, so that's, like, a whole different, like, you know, regiment system. So we get up at 6. I stayed on campus. We had to be at class by 7.30. So from 6 to like 7, 15, 7, 20, you're in the gym. And then after that, you got practice. So you got school all day. You got workout, school all day, and then practice again. And then by the time then you got study hall or something, you go to sleep. So I did that for two years prior to coming to the NBA. I get to the NBA. A hey, practice is at 11. Practice is over at 11.45. Have a good day. We'll see Damn, you y'all weren't practicing long, huh? And we won. No, no wonder you won 18 games. Exactly. <laughs> we won 18. I mean, he was running to play golf every chance he got. I was just like, are, are, is this real? Is this? And yeah, I got PJ Brown. Like, don't worry about a young fella. You know, you, you, you got a long career ahead of you. This is this is gonna be behind. You. I'm like, this is this is really the NBA right now? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like the you mentioned 
com- coming in earlier when you played for Cleveland. Yeah. I feel like when I first got in the league, guys didn't come early. Guys didn't stay after. No. Like if you're practice, we, we practice longer, by the way. We practice for <laughs> at least an hour and a half. But if you had a two hour practice, let's say it's 11 o'clock, you're getting there, unless you have like a, an injury you've got to get treatment on, you're getting there 1030-ish. 1030-ish all day long. You're bouncing at, you're, by the time you shower, put your sweats back on, you're out of there 115. Yeah. For an 11 o'clock practice, a normal practice, like at the end of my career, that is a 9 to 330 endeavor. Easy. 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 Yeah. It's a t- and, and by the way, it wasn't just me. You're, right. There's an expectation now. Uh, you got a treatment table, weight room, hot tub, cold tub, uh, shots before, shots after, maybe some film work with your development yep. coach. Then maybe you do another weight room session. Then you call. Like, it's an entire day. It, is, it was so different than when I first. I remember because by, by, by like fourth, third, fourth year, I had developed my routine. Like, this is when I'm going to show up. This is what I'm going to do before, after game days. I had my routine. And I was in Orlando for seven years. And then when I got to LA, I remember like my first week of training camp. And then coming back from that, I was like, oh, I'm just with a bunch of guys that are like me. Because right. it was the first time that the whole team was doing that shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. That's what, that's how it was in, uh, when I got to Cleveland. Like, that was the first time I seen the whole team in the weight room and uh, on the court. Like, we were doing individual workouts together. Like, it was it, it was something that I've never seen before. Like, literally, and I, I catered a lot of that to Brown because his, his work ethic and his drive is ridiculous. It doesn't matter if you're the – 15th man on the team or the second man on the team. He'll go work out with you. He's going to get shots up with you. He's going to talk to you, communicate with you, like what's going on, what do you see, whatever. And for me, once I really got around that winning mindset, like, no, this is our expectations. We expect to win. Not like, oh, we're just going to get there and then see what happens. Like, no, we, we expect to win. And when I put that in my mind, I'm like, oh, that's what made like when people like look at my game when I went when I left New York to get to the, to Cleveland. It looks so much different because I realized like you don't need me to win. You don't need my offense. Kyrie can go for 30, 40 whenever he wants. Bron can do pretty much whatever he wants. Kev is coming off twenty twenties. All I got to do is play defense and spot up. Easy. Yeah. I actually I have a lot of LeBron questions and I'm sure Tommy does. I, I want to ask about one other teammate because yeah. we were talking earlier in your career. Um, you played with uh, Chris Paul his rookie year. Was he as fucking annoying back then as he is now? Did he did he yeah. just consistent annoyance? Yeah, nah, and <laughs> even make as it, a rookie, it make it so it make it so bad. I had Chris. I I thought I was a vet my I still, my second year. <laughs> Chris, so we have we, New Orleans. We, he gets drafted by New Orleans. I'm in. I'm in. The, uh, I'm at the draft party going crazy in the, in the, in, the, in the, um, whatever the arena was called. In. And sure enough, like a week or two later, Hurricane Katrina happens. So we go to Oklahoma City. So I'm like, okay, cool. Uh, he hits me up like, yo, man, I mean, my family's going on this cruise. You want to come? I'm like, yeah, why not? I'm 19. He's 19, 20. So I'm like, yeah. I go on this family cruise, and the whole time he won't stop talking. He won't stop talking about, <laughs> about everything. You know? I'm like, oh, my God, I hope he's not really like this. I get a just so happened, of course, we live across the street from each other in Oklahoma City. So he's driving me to practice every day because I'm like the quote unquote honorary vet that I named myself. So he's driving us to practice every day. And short enough, talking, 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 sit next to him on the plane, talking, talking, talking on the bus. So I'm like, bro, at what point, at what point do you just chill out? Do you relax? He's so turned up. I love CP, man. He's a great dude. Man. Oh man! Did you did you have any stories? We've talked we've talked about this with him when he's come on, and with some other guys about him in general. On the court, he's manipulating the game all the time. Yeah. Did you did you see him do anything on the court where you were just like, this dude is just built different? We played Denver in a training camp in Denver, and Andre Miller was guarding him. And I like people don't give Andre Miller enough credit for how good he actually is. And offensively and defensively, and just smart knowing the game. I don't, and I found this out after, like, you know, playing with Dre. But the things he was, like, able to the, the maneuver and see as a rookie, like telling coaches coming off the pick and roll, no, nah, he's going to do this, coach, and I'm going to go, and, like, and I'm sitting here listening to him, like, 
Yeah, okay. He thinks he knows everything. That's CP. Yeah, okay. And then sure enough, dude jumps the pick. He splits the double team, does his little sham guard routine, floater. I'm like, damn. Oh, he's he's all right. Sure enough, two games later, he's like, he's averaging like 20, 25 in, in, in training camp. I'm like, as a rookie? Oh, no, he's he's serious. He's serious. But it, it's funny because we got into it one time, and I was, I was starting, and we were like one of the quote-unquote new duos of the league because we were so young. And uh, Byron Scott got mad at me for taking certain, uh, some kind of shot or whatever, and I didn't get back on defense. So I was like, all right, cool. So, so timeout happens. CP's sitting in the first seat. I'm sitting in the second seat. And he's, like, digging in my ear, like, come on, bro, I need you, I need you, I need you. I'm sitting there like, man, I need you to pass me the fucking ball. <laughs> like, I, that's what I need, right? He looking at me like, he like we get into we like low key get into it, and it was it was one of the it was one of the better moments because at that moment I knew like he's down to win, like more than anything he's down to win, and I, I was like okay, not, like this is my dog, I can roll with him. I I love that story, I really do, <laughs> because I don't think I've had a teammate that I've cussed out more or that has cussed me out more <laughs> than Chris. But I always went back yeah. to, nah, he just wants to win. It's That's just it. it's just CP being CP. 100%. And one thing I know about CP, he's like one of the most incredible, incredibly competitive people I've ever seen in my life. We went to uh, like this roller coaster spot in North Carolina <laughs> and when I t- for his his wedding. And I tell you, no lie, he would not leave this place. Like, you know the... Like the little uh, games on the side, but they got that one, and you got to climb the ladder. Like it's, it's hooked to the bottom and it's hooked to the top, and you got to climb the ladder. He was sitting there for like an hour, literally. He would not move until he got it. I'm like, this dude is nuts. He's nuts. How did oh how did your God. how did your mentality change when you got to Denver? Uh, in Denver, I was more like, I think in Denver, I was way more rebellious. Like I, I felt like it was like the hell with the media, the hell with the coaches. Um, I was coming off like a really bad interview my my second year, and I was talking talking to, about the coach and like how not being able to really com- being able to communicate with him because again he's an older guy. He didn't didn't like younger players. This, this, like is, this is Byron. Byron. This is Byron. Yeah. Didn't like younger players, and like his whole staff was pretty much like that. Except for Kenny Gaddison, and it was just like. I like every anytime I would ask him something, it was like, oh, that's a stupid question, Rook, or this and that. And it's just like, okay, so I'm not gonna ask you anything. I'm just gonna go out there and mess up. And then if you get mad, you get mad. So, and when that when when that article came out, it kind of changed. Obviously, our he and I relationship and some of the other coaches. But when I got to Denver and started dealing with George, it was just like, oh my god, like no, like I can't keep like if this is what the NBA coaching is like, like bro, how like how are y'all considered like? great quote unquote coaches if you like if y'all act like this and it's like to me there's no worse feeling if you feel like the head of the game is throwing salt in the game like if you got everybody else playing hard and trying to like trying to do certain things and you literally throwing salt in the game like trying to mess with players heads so they don't even like mesh together it's like what do you like why like i don't i never understood that like if I come to you and tell you something about him, and then go to you and tell you something about him, and then just watch and see what happens, mm. it's like, mm. and it didn't even have to be true. It literally did not have to be true. Oh, Melo just said you shoot too much. You shoot too much. Oh, Jr. says you don't play defense. I'm sitting there looking like, yo, bro, did you say that? He's like, nah. He's like, yo, did you say this? I'm like, no. He's like, okay. I always find that interesting because when I would have a coach that would. uh talk shit to me about one of my teammates, I would always think to myself, what does he say about me to my teammates? A hundred percent. A hundred, it's like, not only just to my teammates, you probably go home and tell everybody everything. Like, what is going on? What is What goes on in those coaches' meetings? <laughs> I, wanna, I wanna be a fly on the wall. Um, when we started this podcast, I wanna be very clear, Tommy, when we started this podcast, I personally had no intention George Carl or Byron Scott catching strays today. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, see, for well, for Byron, I'll give Byron a pass because that was more me. That was just me being young, dumb, and not really knowing, knowing things. 
Now George, he can catch all the strays. Yeah, well, he. I mean, we don't have to. We don't have to relitigate it if you don't want to. But it's like he's he's taken a lot of shots at you since then. Since that time he did in the book and everything like that. Uh, I mean, he. I think honestly, I think he lives to take shots for at, at people now. And it's like, at, at, like, dude, at what point do you like even? Do you not think you made any mistakes? Like seriously, we didn't have one out of bounds play my whole time playing for this man. If you go back to that Lakers series, we lose. We lose on three out of bounds plays. Trevor Reza steals all of them, and we lose. It's like how do you can like I don't know. You got Gary Payton, Sean Kemp, and Dallas Shrimp, and all these dudes, and like you you've had crews. How could you be can labeled a great coach just because you won in the regular season? You can win games. If you coach long enough, you're gonna win games if you got the right talent. Right. What was the what was the your your favorite moment with AI? I think my favorite moment with AI was like when he came he came into the locker room and pretty much let everybody know. Like, if it's not me, and if it ain't him, I'm talking about Melo, then like literally, give the ball up, <laughs> and he was. But you, you know how like, you know when people talk indirectly, but they're talking directly, and it was just like you felt you felt that. No, it you? it wasn't towards me <laughs> it, because he like fortunately like he knows who can score who can't, and he also like he's a bit, he has a huge problem with people who can't score having the ball at any point in time, unless it's like a dribble handoff or, or taking the ball out. He does not like it. So <laughs> it was just so happened as one of our big guys. And it was just like, and he's not like rap too tight. So he's like, he, he might fight you. So it's like, he, we don't want that in a locker room at halftime or anything, but it's like, it's just like AI comes in and is like, Oh, what? You heard what he said. <laughs> you heard what he said. Give him the ball. How, how would you just in general describe that group of people in Denver, your teammates? Oh, like man. we were. Um, it's funny because I feel like we had a like that was probably the core of like just a, a bunch of great dudes. We had that. It's just that we didn't have uh, zero. We had zero guidance. Like our, we were literally like misfits out there. Like we, we had all the talent. We had, you know, scoring, defense, athleticism, speed. We had it all. It's just zero guidance for us. Like we, we couldn't get out of our own way. I think a big takeaway that I've had today so far is just the importance of leadership, good veterans. Tommy and I spoke on Monday. We were talking about. It's like what makes a good organization? What teams would we, we would be willing to bet on for the future? And like as much as the and it is like as much as the NBA and winning at the highest level is about four or five guys yeah. that can really move the needle. Maybe it's a little bit more in today's NBA right now. Maybe six or seven. It really is about the front office and the coaching staff and the right veterans at the right time in their career because yeah. I don't know, man, like I, this is just an observation because I, I didn't know any of this stuff before we were talking, but this idea of redefinition and the perception of you seems to me like we may have had a different perception of you had you had those building blocks and that infrastructure in place. For sure. And I'm not making excuses for you, Jay. I'm not at all. Because I think there's tons of players, that, and I probably was a dickhead my rookie year too, but there's tons of players that come in, and if you don't have the right system in place for young guys, it's really tough to learn on your own at yeah, that age. 100%. Like, I, I, don't, I don't make excuses for myself. I just look at it like you don't know what you don't know. And you walk into a completely different situation, like at 17, 18, and you see 35 year olds and 36 year olds doing it. That's what you think life is. That's what you think you're just supposed to be doing or whatever. So for me, I don't make excuses. I understand where I'm at, but more than anything, I try to lead by example and not have the younger generation fall down that same path. And like to your example, like what you're saying about having older guys, especially at the right times, like a, a guy like Mello, who's a super who's been a superstar 
He's a great dude, understands the ins and outs of the game. Is He can help so many different people. And I look at uh, like a, a, a team like Memphis who just went through what they went through with Ja. And it's like, if you have a, a legit vet, a legit guy, that doesn't happen. Because that even, even the incidents of it, it com- the conversation comes up and uh, and the vet lets you know like yo listen this is not how you do it especially if you're a star and there's very few people who know what that feeling is to be a star or opposed to being role players and it's just everybody else who's just telling you what you want to hear it's a fair point it's a fair point and i agree with it and this is not in reference to ja and the grizzlies i do question at times the role that an organization plays in the behavior. Oh, I agree. So you can have great vets and the vets can try to guide and try to hold people accountable if the organization top to bottom is not doing that. You still run into the same fucking issues. Very true. You still run into the same issue. Very true. Going to Cleveland and experiencing that. Yeah. Four straight finals. The feeling of relevancy. We feel relevant as NBA players, but that feeling, how do you describe that? Because it is different. Yeah, it's definitely different. Like, how do I put this? This is, it's very hard to turn off um, because you're, like, especially when you're used to winning and used to, like, you get into a role where you're, like, three, four years in a row, and Obviously, people notice you more, recognize you more. Um, but in Cleveland, like, I feel, I feel like that's where it's like all my puzzle pieces connect. Because, like, in, in Cleveland, it's like, I mean, after we won it, I was literally going any and everywhere with no tickets. Like, I was pulling up the Yankee games with no tickets. I was going to the Indians games with no tickets. Cowboys, Giants. Like, people are literally like, just, oh, come on, let's go. Like, and it's, it's, it's very hard not to get caught up in that because obviously there's a winner every year. And the, normally whoever's on that float is going to get those perks and opportunities. And it's very hard to not get caught up in that because when you see people like treat you a certain way and then it just stops, it's like retiring. You know, when, you, when, you're on the, when you're on the floor and you, you, you playing, everybody wants to pick up the phone and talk to you. Once you stop bouncing, like, I'm sorry, like the Johnson and Johnson just don't want to holler at you, bro. <laughs> like your kid is cute, but like they not just about to be sending packages out like that. I, I played on those Orlando teams, and I actually, I actually thought we were we were going to play you guys in '09. I thought so too. I thought that's who we. I thought you guys were going to beat the Lakers. I really did going into that series. I was like, if we can beat LeBron in Cleveland, I'm like, we got a shot. We got it. We we can we can play Denver because I think Denver is going to win. I, I love y'all squad. Place. I really did. But I remember you know being on those Orlando teams, finals third year, conference finals the next year, nationally televised games, and then Dwight gets traded, and then my seventh year in the league, we got uh, Jacques Vaughn as the new coach, so stands out. He had gotten fired, rebuilding playing a lot of young guys, prioritizing that, knowing that we're positioning ourselves for the draft. And I think we had maybe two nationally televised games that year, and one of which was Dwight's Lakers return, which I ended up getting traded prior to to that. I think the game was in March. But there was just this feeling that season, and some of it was the losing, but there was this feeling that season of inadequacy yeah. and b- being irrelevant. And... Going into that free agency, I thought I was going to have to choose between Milwaukee, Detroit, or uh, Minnesota. And Joe Dumars met with him, sold me the world, never offered me a contract. (laughs) Milwaukee ghosted me. (laughs) So it's like Minnesota, they gave me a good deal. And I'm like, all right, yeah, I'll take it. You know, I'm trying to make money in my career or whatever. And then like at the last second, Doc called. And he's like, can you have dinner tomorrow? And I was like, yeah, sure, I'll come have dinner. So we're trying to like hold off Flip Saunders, you know, from <laughs> trying to negotiate the next, last piece of the deal. But at that dinner, what I said to Doc, I was like, Doc, however you got to make this happen. <laughs> Just <laughs> make it happen. I was like, I want to feel relevant again. 
I miss that. I miss yeah. being on a good team. 100%. I, I miss being on a team that plays big games on national TV. I miss, you know what it is for me is like at different points in my career, I had to redefine what winning was. Mm. Now, when I was on a good team and it, we, I knew we could be a top playoff seed and I knew we had a chance to win a championship. It was very easy for me to be like, I know what winning is. Yeah. If you're not on one of those teams in the NBA, you can't. To me, this the dysfunction uh, comes from the selfishness of the of, of players. You yeah. know, letting it affect the group, right? So you can't allow your own selfishness to get in the way of other people. So you have to like fucking play mind games with yourself. Yes. And so what you're describing, those four years in Cleveland, must have been the greatest thing ever. It was amazing because you only got little tastes of it. Before that, it was amazing. The worst though is right after that when Braun leaves. <laughs> yeah, four years it was amazing. And then Braun leaves. They fired T. Lou. They were like, "Okay, yeah, we're just gonna rebuild and just start work, you know helping the young guys out." I'm like, "Did I? Do we just? This the same team? Okay, it's a little weird, but all right. <laughs> you just go like literally, just like from from start to finish. You were going from." having a mindset of winning the championship when when we lost in 15 the next that from the day we lost the, the next year it was automatically going back and winning the championship the next year it was going to try and repeat then KD comes of course we lose then and then now I got that when he leaves it's just like okay so we're just going to try to be competitive who what do you mean just try to be competitive. We just went to the finals four years in a row. We got to make some moves. We got to trade for somebody. <laughs> I know we gonna get Brown, but we got to get Kai back or something. It was that's a, that's nerve wracking though. When you go from really good to really bad, or like just being good, used to being good, and then go bad. It's 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 really bad. What would it have taken to beat KD's Warriors when KD was there? Those I don't mean like his team. I mean like. The Warriors teams with KD, I want to be clear because I know Steph stands are very sensitive. Yeah, they, The Warriors teams when Kevin Durant was <laughs> on the team. Sorry, I misspoke. Steph's team. Okay, guys? Steph's team. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> they are serious about that, though. For They're real. so serious about They're it. Serious. Like, serious. It's nuts. <laughs> uh, honestly, for us, I, I mean... At that point, if you add like a Devin Booker or something on our team, like, I don't know. Like, when you sit here and look at it, like, you got three, le I mean, four Hall of Famers. I say three legit because people question Draymond. Draymond will be in the Hall of Fame. I but I, I know what you're saying, too. It's like, we, we're basketball players, and right. we are like offensive basketball players. Yeah. I'm, and so you think immediately of Clay, Steph, and KD. I get it. It right. wasn't a knock on Draymond. You, right. And you, you see those guys on the, around the wing. It's just like, all right, well, we can't double him. And we sure enough can't double him. And we can't leave this guy just butt naked open. Hey, look, man, we're going to play hard, fellas. <laughs> Good luck. But before we get into some of the 2017 stuff, I wanted to talk about the, fin the 2016 finals. Did you guys, um, you personally, was there at any point when you were down 3-1 that you had any doubt? No, because for me, like, and... I was like, and this would have me so mad after we go down 3 1. Cause I felt like the year before, if we have Kyrie healthy, he goes out to Atlanta, Kev healthy, uh, gets his arm pulled out in, in um, the Celtics series, the first series. If we have that team with that, like the, with the way we were flowing up at the, at, at the finals, we win 15 for sure. It's not like, I don't think the Warriors get as much confidence and start going on runs like they do without that first chip. Because that's just that's just like, oh, we here. Like, this is what, like, you know, obviously they were having a good year as a team regardless. I mean, Steph was having his year. Clay was having his year for sure. No knock to them. But the way we were just meshing, it was just, it was perfect timing. And then you, I mean, you got, you got I love Delhi to death, but Delhi could, Delhi almost died guarding Steph Curry. <laughs> No, literally almost died. If you, if we we have footage of this man in an ice tub, like literally to his neck trying to guard this man. He, you're not crazy. wrong, by the way. I actually, the, randomly on my Twitter feed the other day, I uh, Dilla Dova 
montage video popped <laughs> up from the 15 finals. And I was like, I'm going to watch this. I'm going to watch. I'm going to take the time to watch this. Man. Fuck, he tried. He tried. No, he, he, he battled his ass he, off. What? I like, competed. You, I love, just for watching, from watching that, Della Vadova is by far one of my greatest people I, I, I like of all time. Like, he was, he literally gave everything he had, and there was no excuse. There wasn't, there wasn't like, oh, he just had it going. It was like, no, it's like, oh, I'm trying or no, 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 no. It wasn't none of that. He could barely talk after that's how hard he was trying. Like I, that respect level for, to me, it goes through the roof. Are there any specific moments, memories in 16 after you go down three, one in the locker room, in the days after leading up to game five? Like, are, is there anything that stands out about that time period, final buzzer? Up to game five. Up to game five, I think James Jones and Mike Miller. Like, they really, like, I feel like it was more their doing. They were, like, the fairy godparents of the team. <laughs> like, they were more, like, pulling guys aside. Like, listen, like, give, doing things that coaches wouldn't do. You know, like, putting guys in check in certain, like, listen, bro, I need you here. It's not like certain coaches just feel like they can't talk to certain players or how you gotta how you have to talk to a certain player type like they 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 already knew that, but they were more in a sense of like putting that fire up on you. They did it with Kev, they did it with Kai, uh, they did it with they did it to an extent with Braun, because you really don't have to do too much with Braun because he sees the game as it is. Um they definitely they did it with me game seven at halftime. Um they did it with Shump. It was like it was literally like watching like two old guys come around and walk around the locker room and just pick our spirits up. And you literally seeing people's whole emotions change after conversations. It was just like, okay, he came in, barely spoke to anybody, head down, like just, and then we're ready to go shoot around. He's just, yeah, let's go. Like, I'm sitting there like, Kai, I never see you switch like that. Like, you good? Is everything all right? What, what just happened? Shump, you all right? Like, what's... <laughs> Okay, let's go. Uh, in it's vets, man. It's vets. vets. You need it's, vets. In, in game six, when Kai and Ron were going crazy, are, are you guys just like, let's just like get get them the ball and get the fuck out of the way? That was that was my mode anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I tell I used to tell Kai all the time. I said, bro, I know you want to score. Don't worry about passing me the ball. Don't worry about getting me shots. The shots will find me. Do what you do. Short, short enough, he'll go five, six, seven straight. Like, with Braun on the court. And it's like, it's so many times I've seen him make, and it's hard to make, not, not say make Braun look small, but like, the things that he would do is like, you would think Braun was on the bench. The way he's scoring, the way he's just like going nuts. We played a San Antonio game. He had 55 on Tony Parker. Oh my God, I forgot Braun was on the court, literally. Like he was going literally. Didn't Braun have a big game that game too? Didn't Bra Braun had a had a high scoring game? I think as he well. had a triple double or yeah, like yeah. something like he probably had like a low thirty something. But yeah. like when you when you got this young dude, just not a young dude, but like this little dude who's six one, but like scoring effortlessly, left hand, right hand, mid range, pull up, free throws, threes, like post up. I'm like this. That was amazing. It's king shit. It yeah. really is. No, um, seriously. The decision to not wear a shirt. <laughs> was it just a matter of comfort? Was it the time of the year? Warm? It was definitely the time of the year. <laughs> it was it was the time of the year. And um, I remember Rasheed Wallace told me this. We, I was with the Knicks. He was like, hey, Swish, man. When we won in, when we won in Detroit, we partied at the at the palace all night. I'm like, really? All night? He said, man, we had it going. I'm like, okay. I'm like, wait a minute. Y'all never left? He's like, nah. I was like, what was you wearing? He's like, dude, I wore my uniform. <laughs> I had the tape on and everything all night. I'm sitting there like, you had your, like, bro, I'm I'm not I'm not wearing no shirt if I if I want to chip. I'm not wearing damn near nothing. And obviously, you know, I'd have, I'd have got a <laughs> few calls and <laughs> been behind the bars a few times if I wasn't, but I just figure I'll take the shirt off. My favorite part about that is this the stopover. You know, the stopover in Vegas. Oh, the stopover in Vegas. You guys were there, what, 24 hours? No, we were there like 10? Six hours. Six hours. <laughs> it's so funny. It, 
It's so funny because like we're sitting here like go, as the game is going on, we're looking like I think it was Dante. Dante's like, yo, we win, we go to Vegas. I'm sitting here like, who's thinking about that right now? <laughs> this, like, is <laughs> this is during the game. He's like, yo, we, we win, we go to Vegas. What? <laughs> hey, bro, we, like this is the biggest game of my life. What are you talking about? But I tell you what, thing, Vegas was a ball. Oh man. I didn't think we were going to, I didn't think we were going to actually make it because, you know, winning the chip, like you don't leave the actual arena till late, late as hell. And, but I think the game was kind of early that day. actually it was Father's Day game. So it was kind of an early game on, especially being West Coast. But when I, when I tell you, we got to Vegas and like, I don't know what they did, but it felt like they hit the green light in the back. And then it, like, Bottles, girls, it started going crazy out of nowhere. Like it's like they knew we were coming, but like I feel like the crowd knew we were coming because like when when we walked in, every, of course everybody parts the Red Sea. They see Braun is just like yeah. and he's just like part of the Beatles, literally. This is we're biased because you're sitting here, but th- doesn't it feel like that was a particularly exciting because of everything it meant to Cleveland? All the fun characters that were on the team and everything that it wasn't oh, yeah. a team that was like repeating or something like that. Like it felt like a thing that everybody was not everyone was celebrating with you because obviously Warriors fans were not happy. Right. But there was a lot of interest in it besides just like Cavs fans. Yeah, like and I, I think that's what was the best part about our story because it's like we're literally the greatest, one of the greatest com- sports comeback stories. For one, it's already like a city like Cleveland, who's always been, I think, like the the biggest moment in Cle- and it's not even happened in, in Cleveland history was like Jordan hit the shot over Elo like that's all people like even for me when I was a kid that's all I could remember as far as like Cleveland they had cool jerseys because they had a little baby blue pin stripe through with the Cavs on. like I remember that but like other than like that for Cleveland basketball that was pretty much it and when we won I mean you would literally see 60 50 year old dudes coming out here crying like dude I've never seen a championship in my in my hometown in my city so when I seen when I started seeing that and like really started looking at people like they really looked at themselves as losers in a sense. It's like, yo, we're not losers anymore. I'm like, wait a minute. Like, do you mean this personally? Or do you mean this like as a city as a sports figure? Like, cause I don't I don't think y'all are losers, so so to speak. I just don't think the city is won. <laughs> On the- on the topic of, I always find it, sorry, I always find it interesting though. Like, that's what I appreciate about sports fans. Yeah. Because we were talking earlier about, about just like the identity, man. I'm taking this serious for a second. <laughs> we talking earlier about the identity. <clears throat> uh, that, that our identities are wrapped up in being an athlete and like getting to compete and all that stuff. Yeah. But like, to me, what makes sports is so great is the fans. Like the fact that people care. Yes. That people care that much. Yes. That they're shedding tears because LeBron James chased down Andre Iguodala and blocked a shot against the backboard, and then Kyrie Irving hit a fucking tough Ice shot it. over Curry. Two just random events in the history of the universe. And Kev gets the stop on, on Steph. Yeah, oh, yeah, shout out. Of course, Kev Gotta gets get the stop. my man Kev. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The slow no, feet. Just, the feet was moving that just, day. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it, is, it is an awesome... Like, that story is amazing. I really do. I just... I appreciate it so much, man. I really do. I appreciate it. Appreciate um, it. On the uh, on the topic of redefinition, um, I've always wanted to ask you this, and uh, you know, I'm, why why did you throw the soup? <laughs> so, Damon Jones, he's my guy. I love D Jones. Everybody everybody knows, it. but he has a knack of playing too much, and for me, like. Don't get me wrong. I like to play a little joke here and there, key, 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 but, like, he's consistent with it. And for me, like, if I'm telling you, I'm not in the mood right now. Like, bro, like, I'm, like, I had some stuff going on at home. I wasn't playing well. I'm like, dude, not right now. And sure enough, I'm in the lunchroom, get my soup, and he comes in, and mind you, the soup is hot. It literally, I'm, like, the first person in, in there. He's like, and try to like make me spill it. So I'm sitting, I'm, I, I, I'm not gonna lie, it took me a second too, cause I actually thought about it. So it was like, it wasn't like a rageful throw. It was like, okay, you're playing with me. I know you're playing with me. I'm gonna show you. 
And I literally thought about it and I, I threw it on him. He's over there screaming because the shit is hot. I'm like, see, you want to stop playing now with me, right? You want to stop playing? He, sure enough, the next day he comes up, apologizes, hey, man, you know, you're right. I do play too much. And da, 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 da. I'm like, bro, I don't mind you playing. But when I tell you stop playing with me, I'm not in the mood. Just stop playing with me. That's it. What kind of soup was it? Chicken tortilla. Chicken tortilla. is one of my favorites, too. Nice. Cream-based or tomato-based? Tomato-based. Tomato-based. Shout yes. out to Chef T in Cleveland. That's my dog. <laughs> Sounds great. Sounds great. Did you, uh, what was the fallout of that? What was, it, like, I know you got suspended or whatever, but, like, the actual fallout with your teammates, the organization? Nothing. 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 No, it, 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 for, a lot of it is, like, because it gets out, so the team feels like they have to do something. Like, for me, I didn't really care, but, like, when you start, when you start taking my money, that's when I start caring. Like, bro, he he already admitted he did something wrong. We we he and I we fixed it. He apologized. I apologized for the act and whatever else. Nobody nobody's affected by it. I didn't. It didn't affect Bron any kind of way. It didn't affect Kai or anybody. So like, what is the? No, he's not third degree burned or anything. But you got to suspend me a game or whatever. whatever. All right, cool, whatever. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask similar to this is the, you have a lot of fines from, uh, untying guys' shoelaces. Yeah. When did that start? Did you, did you eventually like work yourself out of it? So I, I was doing it for a while, man. And I started like my rookie year. Cause I remember very vividly doing it to Dwight at the free throw line. And I was like, I wouldn't do it every game, but I would do it like with guys I know guys I messed around with or whatever. And Honestly, I really didn't even, I really don't even, still don't, to this day, don't even really know how it became a thing to where, like, you're getting fined 50 grand or something like that, whatever. Because I, I remember I did it to Sean Marion on a, on, a, on a baseline or whatever. And, you know, I get a call from the league and it's just like, oh, man, you're out, you're, like, you're trying to sabotage people. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, have y'all ever played basketball before? <laughs> like, you you making it seem like I have such a, a, a an advantage that oh my I can hit twenty more threes than he can because I untied his shoe like are you serious right now oh so he can't run full speed because his shoe's untied that's what it is okay you never tried with me did you I can't remember I don't think I don't so. think you did you, there's no way you would ever be to be able to untie my shoe that's the thing I never understood about <laughs> this. Like, how loose are guys tying their shoes? You know what? That you can just do it with, like, a pole. I don't get it. I, 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 dude, I would, I'm would. i a double knotter, and I'm like a fucking <laughs> vice grip, you know? I got to double knot my girl's <laughs> shoes. I, I'll double knot mine. It's funny, man. Like, a lot of guys are like that, though. Um, Earl Boy, because he used to tie his, his wedding band and his shoe yeah. and, like, triple knot it. I'm like, bro, you better triple knot that. <laughs> you come home without that. It's over for you. Did you did you follow when you were playing all the memes? Because you just were like an, you were an internet favorite. It was like every time anything like this would happen, it would be it would be all over the place. I, I feel like it's hard not to see them, yeah. like especially when people are like in your mentions or whatever. Like unless you're just not a social media person, it's like almost impossible not to see them. But I don't like I don't I never got mad at it. Like only thing I didn't like was the Henny God thing because it was just blatantly not true. Like you could have gave me give me something I drink. At least, at least How do did that, that even start? I have no idea. Uh, all right, before we let you go, I, I actually have one more question. Yeah. Favorite dunk all time in your career? Do you have one? Only because that's my boy on, on bra and at the guard. <laughs> <laughs> only because only only it's bra. You had, you had, I don't know that it was on me, but when you were in New York, you guys used to run a strong side pick and roll. And as the ball handler came off middle side and this is back it. before like everybody was in drop coverage like you'd be a hedge yeah and i'm the corner guy you're in the corner what do i do i gotta go tag and you guys took advantage of everyone in the league doing this and you would back cut and fucking yeah. pablo prigioni would go <laughs> lob to you pablo and look it's on the scouting report Stan had said, watch, coming out of the timeout, watch this. They might run that play for JR. And I'm like, I knew exactly what he was talking about. All right, I'm locked. I'm locked. But, like, the instincts took over. <laughs> you know Gotta what, go tag. Gotta go tag. You know what happened to me like that? Instincts took over. Uh, 
Byron Scott, my rookie year, first time guarding Kobe. And in and, and practice, we go over, and like, a little walkthrough or whatever. He's like, yeah, he's going to go two dribbles baseline. He's going to pump fake. He's going to pump fake again. Just stay down. No matter how many times he pump fakes, just stay down. I'm like, all right, go through, go to shoot around. Look, look, Rook, he's going to take, go right, two dribbles, pump fake, pump, just stay down. I'm like, all right, man, I got it. Like, I got it. Like, all right, if you, you act like that, the moment he do it, and he you jump, I'm taking your ass out of the game. Bro, when I tell you I wasn't in the game seven seconds, <laughs> sure enough, out of a timeout, I get subbed in, catches the ball on the wing. Two dribbles right. What do I do? Boop. And one. And sub. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God. Like, it was like literally like a song he wrote, man. It was crazy. Uh, before, before we go, yeah. did, I wanted to get a favorite moment from you, both from the Knicks experience and then also uh, just from the bubble run, too. Knicks, I would say, like, just having my family come up. Like, my parents used to catch the train to the to the garden, and, like, we used to really, like, kick it and have, like, almost like, almost like, you know, you playing on Broadway and, like, that play-type feel. Like, that's how it was for me. Like, we would go out to eat, we'd go to the, or we'd go to my game, go out to eat, maybe, like, do something. Out. And it was, like, a really fun time because I didn't grow up a Knicks fan. Like, my dad was a diehard Knicks fan. That was literally the only reason why I went to the Knicks um, was because of that. Because I was originally going to come from China and try to go to Clippers, and CP was calling me. I'm like, all right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Melo was like, oh, no, no, no. I'm like, fuck. But um, that, I would say that for the Knicks. Um, the bubble, the bubble is not fun, man. I think the the best part about the bubble, it felt like uh, like ABCD camp. Like, it felt like like literally back in the day, you got all the boys, these dudes, like, you know what I mean? Like, you got all your guys. Like, and it was the first time in a, like, in a while that I've gotten, like, Marvin, Dwight, Rondo, all these like dudes I came out of the McDonald's game with all in one setting and we actually sat down and chopped up like, yo, remember this? Remember this? What happened with this? What happened? Like, we actually got to kick it. So for me, I think that was like the two better moments. Jared, you've been an awesome guest. We appreciate, appreciate it. it man. Um, DocuSeries is great, man. 